39 years of marriage, can you imagine how long that is? It's a big chunk of life spent together. I dreamed of living to the end with my wife, with whom I have been together for many years. My friends and colleagues envied me because I had a really strong marriage, but it only seemed that way at first glance. Yes, damn it. I exclaimed into my cell phone as I drove west on the highway, about two hours from Columbus, on a beautiful Sunday in July. The sun was shining brightly as I was talking loudly on the phone. I was driving along the highway at a low speed, with both windows down and the hatch open. The car seemed like a wind tunnel, but the engine was purring steadily and handled no worse than a more expensive car. My car was a 1996 Ford Probe, known as one of the most expensive cars in Detroit, and it belonged only to me. Recently, during our trip to Washington, I received a retirement gift from my wife. The next day, when I picked it up, I couldn't contain my delight and exclaimed to Tracy, it's just amazing. She replied with a smile, I'm so glad you like it. Just don't forget to use it responsibly and avoid costly speeding fines. Grinning, I assured her, don't worry, I'm just a little over the speed limit and the road is empty. It's going to be alright. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow night, she said, ending the conversation. I threw the phone on the empty passenger seat and let out a joyful scream. I had been on the road for about five hours, planning to stop in Columbus for dinner and spend the night as part of my trip. I've already booked a hotel room. At 63, I didn't think I could handle 12 hours of driving in one day as I would have done at 35 or 45. If Tracy were with me, we could take turns driving and maybe complete the trip in one day, but I was alone on this journey. I've always been a fan of the probe ever since I had the chance to do a test drive. It was the debut model of the newest Ford in 1989, and many dealerships in my area received such cars. As soon as I saw it, I was immediately fascinated by its appearance. After waiting a week, I finally decided to visit the nearest Ford dealership and take the car for a test drive. It was an instant connection. The original Mazda engine was not only fast and powerful but also provided excellent fuel efficiency. The car's handling was incredibly responsive and resembled a racing car. A slight turn of the steering wheel led to the car rapidly shifting on the road. It was truly amazing. I spent 11 years driving my first car and then another 11 years driving the second one. I bought the second car in 1996, in its last model year, and drove it for almost 200,000 miles before it crashed in an accident that was not my fault. I tried to find a replacement on eBay and other sites but without success. As a result, I've been driving an ordinary, unremarkable car for the last two years. After working in the insurance industry for 40 years, I recently retired. Although the job was monotonous, the pay was good enough, and I was able to retire a few years before I turned 65. My colleagues organized a small farewell party for me, which was attended by my wife. They gave me thoughtful gifts, but the most memorable moment was when my wife handed me the car key. I was surprised when I received one of my old car keys along with a note. It turned out that my daughter and son-in-law were looking for a car for me and found it in excellent condition with low mileage near Washington. The plan was for me to fly to Washington for the weekend, spend time with my family, and then drive seven hours to Columbus and stay overnight. After having breakfast on Monday, I would continue my journey and arrive home early in the morning. When Tracy booked the hotel for Sunday, I was confused at first, thinking that she would join me and we would go right away. But she explained that I was going on this trip alone to get to know my new car, a black Jeep GT Turbo. In the 90s, Ford began manufacturing probe engines making them the only possible ones. The car was equipped with a turbocharged V6 engine, which produced a powerful roar but was inferior in fuel efficiency to the four-cylinder Mazda engine. The journey began in the mountains of West Virginia, an exciting but dangerous challenge. Driving in multiple lanes, ignoring speed limits, dodging large trucks, making sharp turns, and suddenly changing lanes, all this created a chaotic and difficult environment that was not for the faint of heart. Based on my previous experiences with the two earlier test participants, I am confident in the ability of this car to overcome any obstacles in its path. Personally, I like to drive in the highlands, but after I've covered that part of the way, the rest of the trip is mostly on a straight highway, which can get tedious since I can't push the car's capabilities to the extent I'd like. The speed limit usually drops to 60 or 65, 
so I usually drive around 70 or 75, but it's important to be on the lookout because there are a lot of police here, especially in Ohio. After talking to Tracy, I stopped at a gas station and bought a soda at the store. The cashier looked at me and then at my car. It's a great car, sir. Is this a probe? His knowledge was impressive, especially considering that he probably hadn't been born yet when the car stopped being manufactured. Yes, that's her, I replied proudly, standing tall. It was a retirement gift that I recently purchased in Washington and am now taking back to Illinois. Wow, she's very cute, the young cashier commented as I nodded and walked confidently back to my car. To show off a little, I squeezed the clutch for a moment before shifting gears and squealing the tires a bit. This is not always easy to achieve in a front-wheel drive car. While driving, I thought about the weekend that had just passed. I treasured the moments I spent with my daughter, her husband, and my only grandson. Now that I've retired, I've made an unspoken vow to spend more time with my grandson in person. Although I was very pleased to see him on FaceTime, nothing could compare to his personal presence. As I drove past a car filled with teenage girls, they honked their horns in greeting, and my gray hair fluttered in the wind. A quick glance at the girl behind the wheel brought back memories of my Tracy in her youth, with long blonde hair, a graceful figure, and, I think, blue eyes. She reminded me of my Tracy, the life of the party. Although she was no longer the same as when she was young, at 63, she was still an amazing woman. Despite the extra pounds and probably more artificial blonde hair than natural, she still manages to attract the attention of our peers and even some young people. Last fall, I was thinking of inviting her to the opening of the museum where she decided to take a bold step by wearing a revealing pink sweater. I could see that she was a little shy about wearing such a bold outfit in public, but she did it because she knew how much I liked the look. To express my appreciation, I thanked her for this gesture. I first met Tracy in my sophomore year at Indiana State University. She had just moved into the dorm where I'd been living for the last two years. When my friends and I were playing frisbee outside, Tracy came with her parents to check in. As soon as I saw her, I was mesmerized. My infatuation was so obvious that one of my friends accidentally hit me with a throw while I was ecstatic. Needless to say, I will never forget this night. I stopped my game and approached Tracy and her family to offer my help. Unfortunately, Tracy's father didn't seem to approve of my long curly hair and politely declined my offer. Realizing his reaction, I stepped back. A week later, I saw Tracy at the dorm and introduced myself. Sensing her lack of interest, I quickly retreated. Two weeks later, I saw her walking with a guy from the dorm who lived two floors above me. He looked like a nerd with a short bristly mustache. It was clear that I wasn't her type, but it didn't bother me at all. Sometimes I bumped into her in the dorm and had polite conversations. Since she was not part of my social circle, I did not feel the need to communicate with her. She didn't show any interest either. I didn't want to make an effort to pursue her. Maybe I wasn't considered a romantic ideal, but I had success with other girls and I didn't feel the need to face someone's negative attitude. Two years later, she unexpectedly showed up at a pre-semester party hosted by mutual friends. Mr. Bristly Mustache had already graduated from university, and she came alone. I decided to try again, knowing that if I met with rejection or a negative attitude, I would just move on. Nothing terrible, nothing bad. At a time when there were few women in this field, Tracy stood out from other business students. A lot of the business students on my floor thought she was pushy, even though she was quiet. It seemed to me that they were afraid of her intelligence and rejection of traditional business norms. When I spoke to her, I didn't expect much, but it was obvious that she didn't like being alone in a crowded room. When I approached her, I noticed that she looked very worried. Her reaction was similar to the fright of a drowning person when offered help. Do you always take two beers? She asked sharply, carefully examining the glasses in my hands. I almost made a sarcastic remark but kept my mouth shut. Mostly, I replied dispassionately. I'm a pretty versatile guy, so I try not to show my favor. When I turned to leave, she shook her head slightly. To my surprise, she reached out and touched my right forearm, stopping me in place and invading my personal space. At my height, I towered over her, but she stood on tiptoe, took me by the shoulders, and pulled me closer, kissing me gently on the lips. 
she left me stunned. Stepping back, she stood on tiptoe, her soft blue eyes mesmerizing me. Holding her close, I kissed her gently, trying not to spill the beer in my hands. We decided to leave the party and spent the next couple of hours just chatting in a quiet corner of the dorm living room. From that moment on, we became inseparable and eventually tied the knot shortly after graduating from university. Although her parents disapproved of our relationship, I didn't care what they thought. After graduating from university, we both found great jobs and life went on as usual. We continued to sleep together, although not as often as when we were students. Allison appeared in our family three years after the wedding and brought us both great joy. We often competed to hold her in our arms, especially when we visited her grandparents. I swear, for the first two years of her life, Allison barely touched the ground when we were at their house. Remembering those early years, I felt joy. When I looked up, I saw that the first exit from Columbus was approaching, but I did not pay attention to it. All I wanted was to go home to my wife Tracy. The thought of seeing her again made me decide to skip the hotel room. I stopped, canceled the room, and thought about calling Tracy to tell her I was on my way. I decided to surprise her by arriving home in the middle of the night and climbing into bed next to her. Just two hours after leaving Columbus, I went into a restaurant at a bus stop. There, I called Tracy, pretending to check on her from my hotel room. She sounded flustered and out of breath, which indicated that she had forgotten her phone somewhere and hurried to answer the call. Hey, save that breath for me for tomorrow, I teased when she picked up the phone. Of course, honey, she replied. I've missed you so much, I said, and the words sounded sincere. We talked a little more before I confirmed our plans to meet the next day. She only replied with a quiet aha, after which we said goodbye. After quickly finishing my meal and refueling the gas tank, I set off again. The windows and hatch were closed for the night, and the howling wind was no longer distracting. The sensor worked flawlessly, and I drove on. Remembering how my wife and son-in-law put me to the test, I couldn't help but smile. Thirty-nine years of wonderful memories flashed through my mind, and I wondered where all that time had gone. By the time I got home at 4.30, I had already reached my house. Leaving my Ford Probe parked on the street, I planned to bring my new purchase to the garage. But when I approached the garage with the remote control in my hands, I found that someone else's car was parked in my usual place. As I stood next to my wife's car, a sudden wave of panic seized me, making my limbs tremble and beads of sweat stand out on my forehead. It seemed as if I was on the verge of a heart attack. After taking a deep breath, I managed to calm down, and the symptoms began to disappear. However, the unfamiliar car was still parked outside my wife's house, and I felt confused and lost. When I turned off the engine, my memory seemed to blur for a moment. I sat in shock and looked at the Mercedes that had taken my parking space. After some hesitation, I decided to go into the garage and open the passenger door of the unfamiliar car. I found the registration number in the glove compartment, and my heart sank when I saw that it belonged to Ralph Pruitt, Tracy's former boss who retired six months ago. Disappointed, I decided to sneak into the house, grab my 9mm Sig Sauer, and deal with both of them. After thinking about the physical confrontation, I eventually realized it was not worth going to jail. Creeping quietly into the house, I went into the bedroom where there was an eerie silence. The door was locked, but I unlocked it carefully and went inside to find Tracy and Ralph Pruitt lying in my bed. Seeing my wife clinging to his right shoulder, his arm comfortably wrapped around her, reminded me of how Tracy and I used to sleep. The way they hugged each other seemed so familiar, as if it wasn't the first time. I couldn't help but appreciate the amazing night mode feature on the iPhone when I took two clear photos in the softly lit room. Putting down the phone, I calmly gathered enough clothes from the drawers and closet to last for several days. Bumping into a suitcase in the hallway closet, I quickly packed my things and hurried away, taking my firearm. I left the house again, sneaking back through the garage. I took out a knife and punctured all four tires on Tracy and Ralph's cars. Then I jumped into my car and drove to a nearby place to observe from afar. Tracy, being a pensioner, could get enough sleep, and Ralph had to leave for work early so as not to arouse suspicion from the neighbors. The car was parked conspicuously, with all four tires flat, making it hard not to notice the damage even if you didn't look closely. Ralph's car sensors would have quickly alerted him to the problem when he started the engine. 
Sitting in the garage, I couldn't see what was going on, but around 8.30, a truck from Fred's tire shop pulled up. While they were replacing the tires, I couldn't help but wonder if Ralph had paid for Tracy's tires or if she had to cover the cost herself. I also wondered if they would have the courage to go to the police, even if they didn't know about my role in causing the damage. Involving law enforcement would mean a lot of questions, especially since I needed to be home early in the morning. After Ralph left around 10 o'clock, I assumed that Tracy had hurried to change the bedclothes and clear the house of any evidence of Ralph's presence. I went to Omaha, Nebraska, intending to visit a friend I hadn't seen in a long time. Tracy called when I didn't arrive in time for 3 o'clock, which made me answer the call quickly. I mentally noted that I would soon install Bluetooth in my old probe. Where are you? She asked cautiously. You should be home. I'm in the middle of Iowa on the highway, heading to Spencer, I replied monotonously. What are you doing in Iowa? I know you love to drive, but do you really love this car more than me? At the moment, yes, I answered honestly before hanging up the phone. I stopped and sent her a picture of Ralph sleeping in her bed. There was no response, and I continued on my way, pressing on the gas pedal. For three days, Spencer and Marianne patiently endured my grumpiness as I brought them up to date on the latest developments. Being surrounded by old friends in a difficult moment became a source of comfort for me, although I had nothing to say until the end of the visit. Talking to old friends meant that words were not always needed to express love and support. As I was preparing to leave, Marianne hugged me warmly and assured me that she and Spencer would always find a place for me, no matter the circumstances. This trip home was not as exciting as the previous ones. I don't think I've ever exceeded the speed limit in traffic because it took me more than six hours behind the wheel to deal with my grief and thoughts. I was grieving the end of my marriage because, by that moment, I was almost sure that we would not celebrate our 40th anniversary together. I was thinking about the same familiar questions. Have I made mistakes? Couldn't I satisfy Tracy in bed? Did she find solace in another man? What does the future hold for me without Tracy after all these years? I briefly thought about forgiving her and trying to save our marriage if she wanted to, but I quickly pushed the thought away. Deep down, I knew that I would never be able to forget the image of them together in our bed. I understood that true forgiveness means the ability to forget, and I knew that if I stayed, I would only feel bitterness and resentment. In the end, I realized that divorce was the best choice for both of us, despite the pain it would bring. When I lifted the garage door, Tracy's Lincoln car was the only one there. I took my things out of the trunk and entered the house, finding Tracy sitting on the couch in the family room with a glass of red wine next to her. I took a Corona from the refrigerator and sat down in an armchair. When our eyes met, I saw that tears were beginning to appear in Tracy's eyes. I saw the anguish on her face as she sat up a little but did not burst into tears. I begged her to stop, reminding her that I couldn't stand her pity. If anyone had a reason to cry at that moment, it was me. How could she betray us like that? How could she betray me? Thirty-nine years have passed in an instant. I think some of them were real, maybe the first ten or twenty years. When did she stop loving me? Andy, I want you to know that my love for you has never waned, she whispered. Over time, it only got stronger, despite the pain I caused you. I don't know how to fix it but I know that your love for me may not be as strong as before. How long has this been going on? I refuse to believe that this was just a one-time incident. Your words imply that this has happened more often than you want to admit. Are others involved in this? Have you been cheating with our friends? When I asked the last question, her expression changed from fear to anger. I wondered if I had discovered a painful truth. How dare you suggest that I might betray you with one of our friends? This is outrageous and disrespectful, she snapped, her voice full of anger and resentment. It looks like the accusation is not that far off, my dear, I interrupted. She made a displeased sound and fell silent. Her expression became wary, as if she thought I might harm her. She knows me well enough to know that I would never hurt her, no matter how I look from the outside. She started to speak but then stopped abruptly, realizing that I could reveal her lies. In situations where dishonesty is deeply ingrained, honesty is often the best option. He's the only one, she corrected herself. This has been happening for quite some time, maybe five or six years. I felt a rush of dizziness and I'm sure my eyebrows rose at the mention of this timeline. 
we started dating once and sometimes twice a week as soon as we became comfortable with each other during your business trips. I usually stay alone for a few nights, she said without any emotion, as if it were a simple conversation about mathematics or history. Once or twice a week for five or six years? It dawned on me that I must be either incredibly naive or exceptionally trusting. It's not that you're complicating things, she said. You trust me completely, so I just had to come up with a reasonable excuse for my absence. I apologize for trusting my wife for more than 30 years, I replied, throwing my head back and finishing my beer. When I got up to get another beer, I saw that her glass was empty too. Another one? I asked. Yes, please, she replied cheerfully. I got myself a new beer and filled her glass with wine, then sat back in the chair, leaning forward. Why didn't you just tell me you were unhappy? I could have changed something, or at least we could have parted on better terms, I suggested. But I'm not unhappy, and I don't want to get divorced, she said bluntly. I've already told you that I love you and I really meant it. I want us to grow old together. My expression must have shown my confusion. Listen, Alice, this is not Wonderland. You can't cheat on me with a lover for years and then expect me to take you to the land of eternity on my white horse. In my personal experience, this does not happen. That's why we're discussing this issue, Andy, she replied, referring to me by my full name, indicating her disappointment or dissatisfaction with me. You're smart and there's no reason why we can't come to a decision, even if I have to break up with Ralph to do it. I'm being honest, Andy. I care about you and only you. My relationship with Ralph is purely physical. You could say it's just intimacy. Although our closeness is undoubtedly pleasant, it is only a small part of what unites us. Our connection is much deeper. Why did you decide to give up all this right now? I sat in shock, unable to understand her indifference to our relationship. It seemed like someone had taken my wife's spirit without my knowledge. Wait a minute, I finally managed to say. Do you really think I'm going to let you keep seeing Ralph? She fiercely replied, Andy, the way you say that is incredibly disrespectful. Feeling insulted, I quickly replied, I couldn't help but wonder where the loving woman I married 39 years ago, who swore to be faithful until her death, had gone. Tracy, have you been having affairs for five or six years and you don't see the seriousness of it? I asked. What's going on with you, honey? While she took a sip of wine, I carefully studied her expression. My God, I'm so lucky. Despite her age, she couldn't have been more than 53 and had the build of a 33-year-old woman. I had no idea that this would soon become a problem that I would discover. Do you remember how, a few years ago after menopause, you noticed that I seemed to have gained my vitality? I nodded in confirmation. We were both amazed by her newfound youth and have been enjoying it ever since. I don't remember what her doctor called this phenomenon, but he mentioned that about 10% of women experience it at the end of their lives. When Tracy started going through this, I sought the help of our doctor to support her newfound energy. Despite our age, our intimate life remained satisfactory thanks to medical intervention. All this time, Ralph showered me with compliments, noting my radiant appearance and newfound vitality. We've worked together as colleagues for about four years and established a strong friendship. We even indulged in frivolous flirting, which I found invigorating. I was pleased to realize that at this stage of my life, a man still sees me as attractive and playful. I suddenly interrupted the conversation, reminding her that I had always admired her amazing sensuality. I have often tried to establish contact with you, hoping to deepen our relationship. Doesn't it really matter to you? You are my husband, after all, she said but the real interest in me was shown by a completely different person, my friend. Admittedly, it was exciting. Sometime later, you had to leave for Houston on a short business trip. I don't remember the reason, but I ended up inviting Ralph to have dinner with me that Saturday night. As one event followed another, I found myself taking him upstairs, and for the first time, we truly connected. This experience was exciting and unforgettable. The excitement I felt was partly due to the forbidden nature of our meeting and the fact that he was unlike anyone I had met before. After the second round, we rested for a few hours before he left. Every time he came, we quietly put his car in the garage, and he always left before dawn so as not to attract the attention of the neighbors. 
we've always been careful. I couldn't help but laugh at the irony. Who exactly did you want to impress? The neighbors? Obviously, it's not me, considering that a man is lying in bed with my wife. It's hard to believe that in such a situation, you're talking about respect. She shifted uncomfortably and took another sip of wine. I must admit, it struck me that I didn't wake up feeling guilty for my actions. The only time I felt remorse was when you came home that night. I avoided you for days, wondering if my transgressions were visible on my skin like a stain. But since you didn't know anything and I didn't give away any of your things, my guilt dissipated. It became almost easy to come back a second and then a third time. I just needed to make sure I wasn't going to hurt you. And yet you inadvertently gave him some of my things. Although this is ultimately your body and you are free to do with it as you see fit, you committed to being faithful to me. I took our vows seriously 39 years ago, never thinking they had an expiration date hidden in the small print. Andy, you're exaggerating. Have you thought about the consequences of a breakup and living alone in a retirement apartment? What do we both gain from this? Why did we even start this conversation? I care about you, Andy. I know you're upset with me, but deep down you care about me too. If you want me to end my relationship with Ralph, I'm ready to do it. My anger flared up with renewed vigor, causing my blood pressure to rise. It seemed like we were talking about the future of our relationship, but she decided it was about her relationship with Ralph. I couldn't believe it. I don't want you to date Ralph anymore, especially while we're still married. I shouted at her. After we break up, you can spend as much time with him as you want. I don't care. Divorce? That's not going to happen, Andy, she said dispassionately. I quickly got up from my seat, put clean clothes in a suitcase, packed a few personal items, and left. I drove my car to the nearest budget motel and planned to stay there for the next few days. I was completely baffled by Tracy's behavior. How could she not understand a man she had been married to for 39 years? The next day, I called my old friend and lawyer, William Willie Joseph, and arranged to meet him for lunch. We chose an Italian restaurant where I shared with him the sad events of my recent past over a delicious veal and pepper sandwich. Willie and I have known each other since our days at Indiana State College, and he has known Tracy since we started dating. We even spent time with him and his wife a few times. Do you think she might have signs of early dementia? He asked, worried. This is not typical behavior for Tracy, he added. I agree, was all I said in response. Maybe someone will think I'm soft, but I told Willie to handle everything fairly. She had been by my side for 39 years, and I saw no reason to suddenly become stern. I asked Willie to transfer the fully paid house to her and provide me with the equivalent amount in cash as compensation. I realized that I would never be able to return to this house without imagining them together in our bed. Do you really think reconciliation is impossible, my friend? You've been together for so long, you've grown old side by side. I could see that this situation was as difficult for him as it was for me. Are the standard two-week deadlines for paperwork acceptable, Andy? He asked dispassionately. I was hoping for a rush service, and I'm ready to pay extra for it. Can you provide it by Friday? Why such a rush? If you don't hold a grudge, you didn't complete the tasks that I called necessary. For example, you didn't go to the bank. I can't handle her attitude, Willie. She's too optimistic. Maybe I'll change my mind and let her stay with Ralph. Wow, that's for sure. Friday is too early. It's important to me that you understand the gravity of this situation, Willie. In the days that followed, Tracy continued to communicate with me on the phone and in messages, expressing a desire to make peace, apologizing for the pain caused, and criticizing my obvious stubbornness and immaturity. But I couldn't help but notice the lack of apologies for her own actions in our relationship. On Tuesday evening, I called my daughter and son-in-law to inform them about the divorce and its reasons. Their surprise coincided with my own when I found out what had happened. Calming my anxious thoughts of a conspiracy against me, tears spilled, and after a short silence, Allison cautiously touched on the topic of reconciliation. You've been together for so long, and now that you're both retired, isn't it time for you to relax together by the fireplace with a glass of wine? She suggested softly. That was the original plan, dear, I replied. But your mom has a different point of view. 
she thinks that once I let go of my anger, everything will fall into place. But the fact is, it wasn't just a one-time oversight. Their affair has been going on for more than five years, and they even had an intimate relationship in our own bed. It was in this bed that I found them together. Without delay, I sent a photo of the sleeping lovebirds to my daughter's phone. The notification sound was quickly followed by a sharp sigh from both her and Ron. This disturbing image is now imprinted in my memory, and I'm afraid it will never go away. I understand that over time the memories will fade, but the pain will still remain. It's been 39 years, Dad, she said. Ron, if you were in a similar situation with Allison, would you ever think about forgiving her after five years of having an affair with another man? There was a pause on the phone. I imagined my daughter looking at Ron, hoping for a forgiving answer, but I knew that Ron's principles were unshakable. No, Dad, I wouldn't forgive her, he replied. I would not discount the possibility of resorting to physical violence. Ron! Allison exclaimed. I'm just telling it like it is, Ellie, Ron replied. If you ever did something like that to me, it would be like metaphorical death. At noon on Friday, Willie called to say that Tracy had been served with a subpoena. According to his employee, Tracy looked shocked and then devastated. I arrived at the house around 2 o'clock in the afternoon to pick up my remaining belongings. Tracy was sitting at the kitchen table, clutching a glass of wine and a half-empty bottle. As I passed her on my way to the stairs, she muttered in frustration. You're so cruel. It's only been four days and you're already considering nursing home options. I've already told you, Andy, there won't be a divorce. We will fight this together. We'll get through this and be together for a long time. I love you. It doesn't change anything. I shook my head. It's not a farce, Tracy. I refuse to put up with the idea of settling for the role of an old man. You've broken our vows many times. And just because we're older, you think I should forgive and forget. But I can't forgive, and I don't want to forget, Tracy. I believe that you still love me, but it's not the same all-consuming love that it used to be. With the advent of Ralph, everything changed. I was completely devoted to you. I had no backup plan, no alternative. It was just us, and now everything seems to have changed. Now it's just you, me, Ralph, and whoever comes after Ralph. Tears streamed down her face. There was a part of me that wanted to hold her close and promised that everything would get better. My love for her remained strong even after 39 years of marriage. Love does not disappear suddenly. But despite the pain in my heart, I refrained from insulting words. I went up the stairs in silence. Tracy challenged the divorce process, and her lawyer convinced the judge to appoint a counseling session for the couple. Willie suggested that I follow the instructions and keep quiet, warning that by upsetting the judge, I would only delay the process. We both came to the first session a little earlier than the scheduled time. Tracy tried to chat with me in the waiting room of Dr. Ruth Worlingham, but I answered briefly, not wanting to engage in conversation. She categorically did not want to be addressed as Dr. Ruth and instead led us to her office. Although we were offered drinks, we politely declined. Then the doctor began to lay out the basic rules. We could not shout, call names, swear, or interrupt. In the case of the first violation, a warning would be given, but in the case of the second, the judge would be informed of the insubordination, and the consequences would be appropriate. I was thinking about what actions I should take until Dr. Ruth advised me to listen to others when I was silent. I took her advice into consideration. As someone who felt insulted, I was allowed to tell my side of the story first. Tracy looked impatient and tried to interrupt me, but the consultant stopped her. When Tracy finally shared her opinion, it matched mine, except that she mentioned that because of my busy work schedule, she found solace in a new friend. When I was given the opportunity to respond, I explained to the consultant that I rarely go out, usually only a few days a month, which contradicts Tracy's statement that she feels lonely. Dr. Worlingham confirmed my explanation with a nod and made a note in her notebook. Then the doctor asked about the possible consequences of divorce. Are you aiming for success in this case, Mr. Andy? The doctor asked. No, I'm not aiming to win, I replied, feeling exhausted. I don't think you can find triumph here, only heartache. My goal is just to minimize my losses. 
the one who has been the center of my world for almost four decades is no longer with me. Everything revolved around her, but now that she's gone, there's no way to fill that void. Perhaps I will be left alone in my old age because the woman who meant everything to me did not value our relationship enough to remain faithful to them for more than five years. Mr. Andy, this seems very serious. You are not one to embellish the truth, so why did it hurt you so much? You're right, doctor. I usually keep my emotions under control, but this situation is unlike anything I've encountered before. It would not be an exaggeration to say that she completely devastated me. Just a few weeks ago, I felt invincible after retiring and receiving a car as a gift from my beloved wife, which I treasured very much. We were happy in planning a trip around the country to visit museums, zoos, and other attractions. It was a dream come true to go on a trip with the woman who owned my heart. But my joy was destroyed when I realized that her feelings for me did not match my own. In a moment of heartbreaking silence, the room was filled only with the sound of a ticking wall clock. After receiving answers from everyone else, Dr. Worlingham turned to Tracy, asking her to express her thoughts. She began by expressing her deep affection for me, clarifying that her love for me remains unshakable. But she stressed that her concern is solely related to physical intimacy, not their emotional connection. Tracy repeated her previous explanations to me, making me doubt the authenticity of her words. Trying to hide my disinterest, I tried to continue the conversation. What struck me was her tendency to add new details to the story. The first time Ralph and I really got close was the night after you left for Houston. We had a similar situation that night when you weren't home on Saturday. I felt a little awkward and lonely, which prompted me to invite Ralph to my place. Since you weren't at home, he seemed to take my invitation as something more, which made him flirt with me more than usual. When we started kissing, it was a natural extension of friendship, and I quickly realized that we would end up in bed together. It was an incredible experience, the first time in 42 years of our life together that I physically got close to someone other than you. The realization that this was wrong only increased the urgency of the moment. Despite the circumstances, he behaved like a true gentleman throughout our meeting, which made it even more memorable than usual. But it seemed to me that two close friends were just enjoying each other's company, nothing more. I didn't have romantic feelings for him, and he didn't have romantic feelings for me. But there was a certain connection between us. After that, we hugged as we often do. I confess that I love you. We are friends, close friends, and to my surprise, I didn't feel as guilty as I expected. It was obvious that you didn't even notice my feelings. I realize that as long as I don't take anything away from you, we can remain friends. Even if you hadn't returned home ahead of time, you wouldn't have understood anything and would still have loved me to the end. This situation, which we find ourselves in now, could have been avoided. I didn't take anything away from you. Can't we just ignore what happened on Sunday night and go back to what happened before? Is it really all because of your pride? Suddenly, it dawned on me, it's all about me and my tender ego. As Dr. Worlingham pointed out, our lesson was coming to an end. You weren't very cooperative today, Mr. Andy, he remarked. I couldn't resist making a sarcastic reply. I didn't shoot her today, did I? The consultant warned me, sarcasm won't help you here, Mr. Andy. Feeling frustrated, I hurried out of the office. When we arrived at the parking lot, Tracy tried to start a conversation, but I craved solitude. When there was only the noise of cars around me, I climbed into my old car and turned onto the highway leading east to the Indiana border. After driving for several hours, I stopped at a rest stop to refuel and then pressed the gas pedal and headed back home. It became a monotonous routine of my life, and I found solace only behind the wheel of my 16-year-old car. After our separate consultations, Tracy and I were supposed to have a session together. I didn't ask about Tracy's conversation with the psychologist. It didn't matter to me, and she probably wouldn't have shared anyway. Dr. Worlingham's instructions confused me. She seemed to be trying to convince me to forgive Tracy and at the same time pointing out the possible consequences of refusal, lonely old age. That's my current situation, document. Despite her physical presence, I still feel lonely. Once upon a time, I perceived us as a single whole and myself as half of that whole, but since then she has distanced herself from me, leaving us as separate entities. 
our relationship is not taken into account because she is focused only on herself. It seems that everything depends on her now, and Ralph and I are in the background. I expressed my inability to accept this situation, but Dr. Worlingham pointed out that she claims to love only me. She claims that her relationship with Ralph was not based on love but solely on physical attraction. Really, Doc? Shouldn't you be a qualified psychotherapist and counselor? Don't you see the truth? Well, Mr. Andy, why don't you tell me your version so I can see what you're getting at, he suggested. Can I be honest since we're alone here, or should I be careful what I say? I'm willing to be honest if you're willing to listen to me. I think Tracy still cares about me, but maybe not as much as she used to. If that wasn't the case, she wouldn't even think about being with another man. Personally, I don't believe in the excuse that it's just a physical connection. There seems to be some kind of emotional connection between her and this guy. She admitted that they are very close friends, which makes me believe that there is more to their relationship than just friendship. In my opinion, if you're truly devoted to someone, you shouldn't have feelings for anyone else. While I was talking, I closely watched the doctor's reaction, noticing how he was trying to keep a neutral expression on his face. However, I noticed a few moments when he couldn't hide his reaction. Doctor, I asked, when your partner enters into an intimate relationship with someone else in your own bed, what does this say about the degree of their respect for you? And when we talk about love and respect, how does the fact that it has been going on for more than five years affect that? A sure affair can be written off as a fleeting impulse, but five years? Does she underestimate my intelligence? Even if it's just a matter of physical attraction, how can I ignore or forgive a five-year betrayal? Five years, and yet everyone is focused on the idea that since we are older, I should just forgive her and move on. What difference does it make if I spend our last years alone? I'm already lonely. She left me when she decided to be with him. It doesn't matter if I live alone in an apartment or have a separate room in our house. The result is the same, I'm lonely. And one more thing, doctor. Although she has admitted that she hurt me and regrets her actions, she has never apologized for her behavior. She enjoyed the attention of another man and willingly entered into an affair but showed no remorse. Has she ever expressed regret to you? Having finished my monologue, I got up and began to pace the room. Tired, I sank back into the chair. All your considerations are valid, Mr. Andy. We will have to discuss them at the next meeting, the source commented. Yes. Well, I replied dispassionately. When I got up and left the room, I couldn't help feeling surprised at my own ignorance during my meeting with Tracy and Dr. Worlingham. The following week, Dr. Worlingham started discussing a solution to the problem, which made my head spin. Let's start with Tracy, he suggested. I don't want to end our relationship with Andy. I sincerely believe that we will be able to cope with this and return to a happy life. On reflection, I realized that my previous apologies to him were not enough to express sincere remorse for betraying his trust, which, as I now understand, caused him additional pain. Andy, please forgive me. I deeply regret my actions and do not want our relationship to end like this after so many years spent together. You deserve better. While Tracy was apologizing, I caught a glimpse of the doctor's smirk, which quickly disappeared when our eyes met. The deafening silence in my mind was unbearable. I am grateful to my parents for instilling in me that hitting women is forbidden, otherwise, I could have done something regrettable. I told Dr. Worlingham, the fact that you have been close to him for more than five years shows that you do not regret it. Maybe I could forgive sleeping with him once or twice. Maybe I could forgive a stupid act when drunk and breaking your oath. But I can't suddenly forgive sleeping with him for more than five years. It doesn't match my essence. My answer seemed to upset Tracy a lot as she looked visibly worried. The doctor, on the other hand, looked shocked and began frantically scribbling notes. Although I knew that I would most likely be reprimanded for my behavior, I couldn't help but express my disappointment. It's been two months since we broke up, so without waiting for an answer, I asked Tracy, how many times have you been with him since I left? Tracy's face turned bright red. It was difficult for her to speak, and the doctor's face reflected her embarrassment. I couldn't figure out if the lack of reaction was caused by embarrassment or my own awareness. For a short time, I felt a surge of satisfaction. I was hoping that everything that was happening wasn't happening in our former bed. 
Tracy didn't say anything, seeming to focus on the texture of the carpet. I stood up nervously, meeting the doctor's gaze. The doctor shifted uncomfortably in his chair. I am not in a position to decide whether what you did today was ethically questionable. I have a feeling that the comments were not entirely appropriate. I think I've finished these sessions, and you'll have to tell the judge that you don't think additional counseling will help. Tracy sat in shock while I got up to leave. So that's it, she exclaimed. Thirty-nine years have passed in an instant. I never thought that you could be so heartless and vicious. I guess I overestimated you. As I left, I quietly confessed, I've never imagined you to be a dishonest or promiscuous woman. That was my mistake. It's been six years since my last visit to normal, and as I pulled into the funeral home parking lot, I knew the reception wouldn't start for another hour. But my daughter asked me to arrive early so that I could personally chat with her before the other guests arrived. She and her husband Ron were organizing the funeral at the request of my ex-wife. Two days ago, they came to normal from Washington. Allison gave me the opportunity to help with the preparation or to give a speech at the service or meeting after the funeral. She pointed out that, despite everything, Tracy and I had a successful marriage lasting 39 years, and I probably understood her better than anyone else. That may be true, but I couldn't ignore the fact that in the eight years since our divorce, I had barely spoken to her. The last time we had a meaningful conversation was when I called during a visit to the children after our last meeting with Dr. Worlingham. It seemed that there was nothing more to talk about. When Allison saw my car pull up to the funeral home, she hurried out, followed by Ron and my grandson. Although I hadn't been to their house for a long time, whenever we saw each other, Allison always greeted me with a friendly hug. As expected, she did not disappoint me this time either, readily jumping into my arms like a teenager, even though she was already 47 years old. When she landed on me, I had to pause, realizing that at 71, I was not as agile as I used to be. I hugged her tightly, then kissed her on the cheek, and gently lowered her to the ground. Ellie, this is Kay, my partner in this adventure, I said, introducing a charming woman who, despite being only two years older than my daughter, got out of the car on the passenger side. Kay has kindly agreed to accompany me on a 15-hour highway trip. Half an hour ago, we made a short stop to refresh ourselves because today we have already spent six hours on the road. My daughter and son-in-law were shocked to hear the news. Did you drive for eight hours yesterday at your age? Allison exclaimed. And he wouldn't let me drive for even a minute, Kay added. You probably know your father better than anyone else. He is very selective about who he allows to drive his car. Actually, I drove it before him, Ron said, recounting how he did a test drive for my wife before she bought it for me. When Ron realized his mistake, his voice trailed off awkwardly. Sensing his embarrassment, I quickly intervened to relieve the awkwardness. It turned out that this was the last gift my wife gave me, and if she hadn't given it to me, I would never have revealed her infidelity. It was both a blessing and a curse for me, I reflected. I think she always took it as a curse, Allison added. She claimed to love you, Dad, to the very end, but she felt abandoned by you. I can't imagine what she was thinking, I continued. She continued to date this man for three more years until he was transferred to Colorado. He never invited her to go with him. She held a grudge against him, I suppose, blaming him for the fact that our relationship was over. I think even on her deathbed, she didn't realize that our family broke up because of her. I decided not to sit with Allison, Ron, and the kids outside the funeral home during the eulogy. It didn't feel right to be there. What had connected us was now only a distant memory. During the service, Kay and I sat silently in the last row. The pastor gave a heartfelt speech about Tracy, making many people cry, but not me. I had cried all my tears for Tracy a long time ago. After leaving the funeral home, we returned to Tracy's house where we used to live together. We were greeted by numerous old friends whom I had not seen for many years, and they all expressed their condolences. Kay was always supportive, quietly comforting me and holding my hand whenever I felt like I needed real assurance. When we entered the house, Allison greeted us, and I felt as if I had returned to the past. Everything looked exactly as I remembered it. Tracy hadn't changed anything. Noticing my surprise, Allison commented that Tracy had left everything untouched after I left, in case I decided to return. 
She didn't even bother changing the locks, hoping I'd come back someday. If you still have the key, I'm sure it still works, she said. No, I've only kept the car key since then, I replied, taking the trophy out of my pocket to show her. While Allison was making coffee, I was arranging cups and saucers for the six of us, easily navigating where everything was. While we were working in the kitchen together, she leaned over to me and said quietly, You know, some people thought it was rude and careless that you brought your younger companion to mom's funeral. I have to say I understand what they're driving at. I raised my eyebrows knowingly as Allison poured the coffee. When everyone was gathered at the kitchen table with their cups, I took a moment to address the main issue. I've already said that Kay is my traveling companion, not a romantic interest. We have been friends in Houston for many years, and knowing that I was going to have a long and potentially stressful journey, she kindly offered to accompany me. However, perhaps I overdid it by calling her a friend with privileges, although in fact, she is just one of many of my friends of this kind. My grandson laughed at my remark, and Allison and Ron exchanged surprised glances. Eight years ago, Kay, the head of the Quattro Queen Bridge Club, welcomed me into her circle with open arms. Our friendship blossomed quickly, and soon we became inseparable companions, especially during our games. Kay's generosity knew no bounds, and gradually she introduced me to three of her closest unmarried friends who were also members of the Bridge Club. These ladies, aged from 52 to 60, often sought company or an escort for various events. I blushed with embarrassment, forcing Kay to continue the story. As we got older, it became increasingly difficult for all of us to find single men like your father. Therefore, all four of us, or rather five of us, came to a mutual agreement. This agreement guaranteed that we would all remain healthy and free from jealousy, with no more than two people participating at the same time. After all, we don't want to overload your father, Ellie and Ron, Kay explained. Ellie and Ron still looked confused. Let me know if you need any help. Your father is very healthy for his age, my dears. Nowadays, there are pills that help to cope with some problems, and you know a man's intelligence never fades, does it? Allison and Ron shared an easy moment of understanding. My grandson found the whole conversation funny. Everyone, including me, thought that I would end up alone and bitter. But looking at everything now, I would say that everything turned out very well for this old man.